So I have no relevant financial disclosures with commercial interest related to this topic. However, I am a high consumer of ordering and utilizing MRI in my clinical practice. These are sort of a thumbnail sketch of the ways in which we use or can use MRI in our practice. Uh, the biopsy naive is where I'm going to emphasize a little bit today because that's kind of an emerging market using it up front prior to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Um, where it has a fairly established role is in those patients who've had a prior negative biopsy and you're looking to see if they have cancer that was just missed. Active surveillance and monitoring, um, it's an important use at least in, in a lot of patients' practice including ours. Um, surgical planning, surgical staging, and even in assessment for biochemical recurrence. But we're going to focus on the top three uh, given the time constraints. The AUA has two white papers, if you will, um, policy statements, consensus statements on the use of, of prostate MRI. Uh, this is an evolving field and it's rapid and so it's kind of like when new drugs were coming out for castration resistance or maybe what's happening in kidney cancer now. They're just happening so fast you could write a paper and the next day you're almost outdated. But the prostate MRI joint consensus conference that they did with the Society for uh, Abdominal Radiology um, was one looking at those patients with prior negative biopsies, and then they have an overall arching uh, statement about the use of MRI in various aspects of management. So we'll focus first on that biopsy naive patient. Just by show of hands, how many of you, when a man comes to you with an elevated PSA, would order an MRI first as opposed to moving forward? So really, just maybe three hands. So we've been doing this a long time. We've been ordering it up front a long time. Um, I'll show you some of the information on this. But the rationale for doing it first, the majority, you know, three quarters or more of all of our initial biopsies come back negative. Uh, many clinically significant cancers are missed on that first round as a consequence of that. And some of the things that you guys have talked about and will talk about, extended templates, saturation biopsies, drilling more holes, are all just sort of ways to try to work around and account for some of the failures of just traditional ultrasound-guided biopsy. Um, the AUA policy statement here, uh, this is 2017, so we'll talk about that in the context of the new trials, but they clearly acknowledge that an MRI-guided uh, uh, biopsy can detect more clinically significant cancers than a systematic or blind, essentially, ultrasound-guided, and also that you can avoid uh, uh, clinically insignificant cancers using targeting. We know that the targeting, however, uh, alone can risk missing some cancers, and so they still recommend in the policy statement that we do systemic, systematic as well as targeted biopsies um, when you do an MRI. And then at the time this paper was written, they said that the clinical impact of this sort of MRI first is still remains controversial due to cost and, and need for additional studies. Um, they do mention certain circumstances where there's clear agreement, like if they have no rectal access and there, or there's something about the size of their prostate that makes um, just traditional ultrasound more difficult. Um, but at the time, they sort of left the door open because they said, you know, more studies are being done, and until those studies are completed, such as the PROMISE and the PRECISION trial, they were kind of holding their cards back on fully endorsing the use as sort of MRI first or in a biopsy naive patient. So now the data is coming forward. So this was the PROMISE trial. Um, it was a multi-center study from Europe, and they took patients who were biopsy naive, uh, had a suspicion of cancer, like patients that come to our office, either at elevated PSA by and large, or an abnormal DRE or a family history, and all of them were able to undergo the MRI. So over 500 men. Um, some of the things that were interesting is they had a 1.5 Tesla magnet. Um, all of them underwent that. All of them underwent a truss biopsy. And all of them underwent a templated mapping biopsy. So it, these are not fusion-guided um, studies. These, this is a study where they did sort of this combined prostate biopsy. They did truss and template and then looked at the map of where they found the lesions on the MRI and then came up with their primary endpoints what are the odds that the MRI detected a clinically significant cancer um, compared to uh, trust? And so this was their definition of clinically significant cancer. 
You might argue that it could have been a little broader, but four plus three were more than six millimeter core. So in their study, the, the main things that they found that are important for us are that significant, as defined by what I just told you, cancers were found more often if you would have used the MRI guided biopsy or MRI target, 37% as opposed to about 20% with just traditional ultrasound. And furthermore, um, you would have reduced the number of insignificant cancers to 11% as opposed to 16. So the, um, they didn't use PIRADS, but it was like PIRADS. It was a five um, Likert score system. One was a very low likelihood of having cancer, all the way up to five. And it correlates pretty well with what you'll see in a minute from the precision trial. But the finding of cancer was highly correlated with what they saw on MRI. And so 40 to 80% of these patients with four and fives in this PROMISE trial had uh, significant cancer. So limitations that I mentioned, most of us don't use a 1.5 Tesla magnet unless we incorporate an endorectal coil in the United States. Um, they use a transperineal biopsy technique, which a lot of us don't do, and we just heard a little debate on that. They didn't use a pyrid scoring system, so it was pretty subjective. It could have probably been improved if they would have had experienced radiologists using a standardized system. And again, they didn't target the lesions. They simply extrapolated from the mapping studies what the uh, significance would have been. The second uh, level one evidence, if you will, for uh, MRI first was this study, the precision study. This was a multi-center randomized trial. Um, they went for this non-inferiority, trying to prove that at least it wasn't worse than if you were to do a traditional truss. They took patients who'd never had a biopsy and had risk, just like the other trial. Um, they compared, they did an MRI targeted biopsy and they um, compared that to a truss biopsy. This study was a little different though because if you had a, in the MRI group, if your MRI was negative, they just said, have a nice day, you're not having a biopsy. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the patients that had a targeted lesion that was a three, four, or five went on to get a biopsy. And then uh, they compared that to the ultrasound group. And their clinically significant cancers were sevens, but they didn't have to be a four, three. They could be a, a three, four. So they had 500 men, and um, I'll emphasize this because this is probably the next battle to be fought, 28% of them just didn't have a biopsy. So they came in, they had risk, they said, we don't see something worth biopsying or targeting on your MRI, so um, we're not going to biopsy you. And then in the MRI group, as compared to the ultrasound group, they found significantly more um, uh, prostate cancer, 38% of these clinically significant as compared to about 26%. So that was a statistically significant endpoint that they met. And uh, they met their sort of non-inferiority comparatively. Um, again, fewer men in the MRI group were also allowed to avoid a biopsy, which um, they thought was pretty good, and they uh, found less insignificant cancer using this algorithm. So th this is just a table from the study, but it emphasized the fact that they avoided biopsy in 28% of the men using this MRI um, algorithm, that they found clinically significant cancers more often when they stuck to that as opposed to just traditional ultrasound, and that there were less clinically insignificant cancers, the ones that we might argue don't really need to be ferreted out. This was their PIRADS Likert score, only shown here are the three, four, and fives, and this was a question that we asked earlier, um, and it was 60 to 80 percent uh, for clinically significant cancers when you were looking at uh, standardized PIRADS system and using the four and five um, to guide your biopsy. So in conclusion, they found that these MRI-guided biopsies, um, that they, they were superior to the standard ultrasound-guided biopsies in men at risk for prostate cancer who had not undergone a previous biopsy. In the post-promise and post-precision uh, world, the NCCN has revised their guidelines. It now, in addition to some of the biomarkers that I think you guys heard about yesterday, includes consideration of multiparametric MRI in uh, patients um, up front. Um, the panel believed that the MRI was an important consideration, but that they still felt that uh, while it could inform you on who to do a biopsy on, they still recommended doing the systematic biopsies as well as, as the guided biopsies so that you wouldn't just omit it. And then um, they also felt that 
impatients where you did decide not to um, do a standard biopsy, um, you would still follow them closely. The EAU has also revised their guidelines, and I looked as of yesterday, last night, and they hadn't published them yet. This was just from, um, I think, ESMO, uh, European conference, where they pre presented them. So they're in press in Lancet, but you can see that the European guidelines are now moving up to perform a multi-parametric MRI before prostate biopsy with level 1A evidence strong. They also um, stated that when it's positive, they agree to perform combination of targeted and systematic biopsies, but the evidence isn't as good because if you remember, they omitted some. What we don't know is what happens to that 30% or so that go on to just be observed, and so that's a, that's a study waiting to happen. Um, and then uh, they say when the MRI is negative and the patient is low risk, you might consider other parameters like PSA density, some biomarkers and stuff, um, and possibly omit the, the biopsy. But the evidence or the strength of the evidence for that isn't as good. What about a prior negative biopsy? How many of you, since only a few of you raised your hand for an upfront MRI, how many of you uh, consider doing it in patients who've had a prior negative biopsy? So that looks like a universal um, statement there. So again, urine, blood, biomarkers, even some of the diagnostic tests to look at the first round of biopsies have been shown to be beneficial for improving selection of patients for these repeat biopsies, but they don't really improve the diagnostic yield of the biopsy itself, right? They don't tell you where the money's hidden. In comparison, uh, an MRI has the ability not only to tell you who might have that, uh, potential cancer, but where the cancer is so you can go back and find it. And so this is a real case, 62-year-old gentleman who'd had five prior biopsies. His PSA was rising. It was up to 18. And you can see that he had on the T2-weighted image a very dark spot that you'd wonder how you could miss that, but it was anterior. And if you look back at all the biopsies that he'd had done, they were traditional ultrasound and they were directed at his peripheral zones. Um, he had all the characteristics uh, based on diffusion, another dark area, and then even with contrast enhancement, you can see this is a highly suspicious lesion. It was ranked as a Pyres 5. He had a biopsy. It was a Gleason 9. Um, the patient would think you were a genius if you could figure this out, but it looks so easy when you have the imaging right there in front of you. AUA policy statement, um, is, this was probably why they did the policy statement in 2017, was to show that this is the best, most robust um, data uh, for the use of MRI in management of men with elevated PSAs who'd had a prior biopsy, and they recommended it. Um, they also, the caveats are that it's a high quality MRI and that, you know, not just the technology has to be good, but the experience of the readers has to be good too. And then, of course, just um, you have to take into consideration all of the factors, including the patient factors, as to why um, you're in that situation to do a biopsy. Certainly, a three, four, or five pyrads lesion would be um, worthy of a targeting and a biopsy. They also recommend, though, that uh, you would do systematic biopsies as well as just the targeted biopsies. They don't go down strongly on whether it has to be a fusion biopsy or with uh, software such as which was shown, Uranav or Artemis. Um, cognitive biopsies are permissible, and a lot of us do that because they don't have, have the equipment um, to do it. Um, but uh, I think the idea is that you know where you're putting the needle, so you're using it to guide it. Um, they also state that when you're performing solely targeted biopsies should only be considered once further studies have come forward that show that it's safe to omit those systematic biopsies that now are currently included uh, along with the targets. And then they go further and say that if you have a, essentially a, a negative or non-suspicious um, MRI, that other tests may be helpful in deciding on whether or not you're going to proceed with a biopsy, even in the setting of a normal MRI. And then if you, if you choose not to do a repeat biopsy, then you'd still need to do clinical follow-up, laboratory testing, possibly repeat imaging, et cetera, in the surveillance of these men, because you wouldn't want to dismiss them, have them have a more serious cancer later, and, and you wrote them off. The other use of this is in active surveillance, and I don't know how many of you use MRI in, the, in, in your active surveillance cohort. So let's see one more straw poll of hands for that. So it's kind of an in-between. We had unanimous hand raising for 
repeat biopsy, very little hand raising for up front, and now um, kind of an in-between for this. But we know that the imaging um, can be used, just like we showed, if you, even if you had a first-time uh, systematic uh, trust biopsy, you could have missed a, a more higher-grade cancer, and that's the concern when men are enrolling in an active surveillance that we're not going to be sort of actively monitoring but not treating a more aggressive cancer. And so um, most people think that it could be a value in the active surveillance population. And there's not high level good studies on this, but there's plenty of smaller um, sort of cohort studies that have demonstrated, and I just picked one here for the time sake. This was uh, UCSF, they had 200 patients on active surveillance. None of them had had an MRI prior to enrollment. They get into the um, active surveillance protocol and they were upgraded about 40% of the time and about, about 35 to 40% of those upgrades were attributed to a targetable lesion that they went after using MRI. So um, they were able to ferret out a fair number of higher risk men um, using, incorporating that. And that's at a center where they really, um, Dr. Shinohara, one of the world's experts on ultrasound, he probably has Moog synthesizers hooked up to his ultrasound that none of us have available to us. So um, to, to see it in that setting is probably a little more impressive. Um, so this is a clinical scenario, 57-year-old gentleman. He had a Gleason 6 on a modestly elevated PSA, and he's on active surveillance. Um, he had an MRI that showed a small Pyrads 3 lesion. Um, he had a confirmatory biopsy that was essentially uh, a Gleason 6 tumor, no worse. Uh, his MRI uh, remained stable um, over uh, follow-up, but at year three, the lesion had changed in size. Um, a biopsy of this uh, was performed, and it was a higher-grade lesion. Um, it was, uh, I think, a Gleason 4 plus 3, 7. So you could, you, in, in some places, such as ours, we're not biopsying men every year, and a sort of a punitive annual biopsy. We're incorporating uh, imaging into the mix, coupling it with what we find on their biopsy and other clinical parameters to try and reduce the number of biopsies for obvious reasons. The AUA policy statement, though, because this is an area under construction, is not very strong. They just said that it, uh, the multiparametric has been demonstrated to improve diagnosis of intermediate and high-risk patients and could be beneficial for those men on active surveillance, but there's not sufficient evidence to give a broad endorsement of it at this point. Um, MRI fusion and inbore targeted uh, biopsies offer potential improvement for small or more difficult to reach biopsy lesions, and uh, these um, certainly could be uh, an added value in, in following your patients. They, the inbore stuff, I don't know if any of you do that. We, we really don't send patients to the radiologist for an inbore MRI uh, guided biopsy just of their prostate, with rare exception. Um, but again, they defaulted to the fact that cognitive fusion may be an option for you if you don't have the equipment and the experience of the radiologist as well as the urologist in looking at those lesions um, can't be underscored. These are some conclusions from, from the uh, white papers. Uh, basically, significant addition to traditional imaging for management of men uh, with improved identification of clinically significant cancer using multiparametric MRI. Enhanced targeting approaches have the potential to reduce costs uh, through the reduction of unnecessary and inaccurate prostate biopsies, so less misses of, of those significant tumors. Current evidence supports the performance of this in men with a rising PSA in the setting of a negative standard biopsy, and it looks like most of you have incorporated that into your practice. And then um, they leave the door open because this paper hasn't been updated since promise and precision for MRI up front. Uh, in men with elevated PSAs. Uh, we, we do think that certainly as uh, these MRI techniques become more refined in the future, it will be beneficial for men in a wide variety of settings, as we've highlighted. Um, it'll also help in surgical planning. We know that, although not the source of, not the focus of my talk, uh, focal therapies are an emerging market too, certainly very popular in Europe. And as we see targeted lesions and confirm that they're isolated to certain areas, I think that we will see traction for this uptake um, in the United States as well. Um, but as we sit here today, some of those um, areas are still considered investigational.
So increasingly, urologists are using multiparametric MRI to guide treatment. Uh, the joint consensus statement from the AUA and the policy statements recommend MRI for a prior negative biopsy. NCCN, soon to be published, EAU guidelines will recommend M multiparametric up front before the initial biopsy, and the cost and the quality of imaging by experienced interpretation remains important. All right, so that's the end of that talk. I'm on time.